Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, so welcome everyone for the first first brand new Didactic Friday initiative. So every for every last uh, week, every every last Friday of the month, we will have our uh, Didaktyczne Piątki, which is the didactic meeting in English version, and we will try to surprise you with some spe special guests as today. Uh, so uh, please bear in mind that we are recording. So at the at the end, uh, all the meeting will be available at the YouTube channel. So please, of course, use the chat. Uh, we will try to moderate it. Uh, if you have any questions and you don't have the possibility to speak out loud, just use the chat. I will try to help Urs to, to manage it because I know that in general this chat is li living for itself. Uh, so let's start the introduction. I would like to introduce to you Urs Brandel, which is working at uh, ETH Zurich, uh, at the Rector's Office in a strategic initiative group. For now, it will be changed soon. Uh, and during today's speech, he will probably try to answer the question of uh, how to integrate active coding into existing lectures and curricula. So, Urs, the virtual floor is yours. Okay, thanks for the nice introduction. Um, I'm also not an English native speaker, so grüezi miteinander aus Zürich. Wir haben schönes Wetter da und wir haben auf eine schöne Zeit. <laughs> So that's the Swiss German version. And uh, so I, I think I have prepared a few slides and I'm also running these little surveys to know who who you are. And um, so that gives me sort of a flexibility to deepen some subjects and others not. And I think with that, I want to go into the presentation and show you some of the slides. So, um, you know, the title. And so my idea is that um, we're going to, I, I tell you a little bit about myself and uh, where I work. And uh, I see from you already who you are and where you work. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, I'll, I'll give us a short, a short input about our computational competence initiative and the learning paths that we are trying to establish there. And then uh, you will let me know, or we will have a discussion on whether or not you are also trying to find learning paths and uh, competences in the area of computational competences, but also in other areas. And then, I, I, there's another input from myself, how we are embedding computational competences into existing programs uh, on a curricular level, but also what uh, tools we use for that. And then there will be some possibility for you to try out Jupyter Notebooks if you haven't, for those who haven't really tried them. And uh, as I see, there are people who work with data and coding quite a lot, actually. Uh, there might be also a possibility to show you some of the notebooks that we have and share with you some of the links. Okay, and then if we have some time, I th uh, one idea was that the discussion might go into uh, that you tell me what, what you are doing, but also to find out what uh, what you would need to follow a similar approach or maybe what I would need to follow an approach that you are taking. And so whenever you have uh, a question, I hope that I see it in the chat. I'm not such a proficient Teams user, so maybe uh, you, you just have to interrupt me and open your microphone. OK, yeah, I will try to, to follow the chat and, and let you know if there are any questions. OK, so maybe just a, a few things about myself. So this is a, a slide I had <laughs> done a few. It, yeah, am I still visible because my camera's flipped somehow? Can you see my speaker image? Because yep. I can't. Okay. Yes. That's okay. So, so this is a this is a visualization uh, um, attempt for my actually my work life since I was twenty in nineteen eighty five, and uh, I have studied biochemistry and th there was a lot of science at the beginning of my career then. Kids came pretty soon. I started doing more teaching. 
uh, in a in a middle school, and then I went to ETH and started to do uh, learning projects at the uh, the Department of Environmental Environmental System Science, so agriculture and um, and environmental science. And with me, two other uh, educational developers started a new function, so that each department has a link between the, the technology central didactics units and the departments that run the study programs. And after some years of um, not so, uh, well, we, for, for a couple of years, we weren't so much known, but then we had a boost and now everybody or every department has such an educational uh, developer person. And it's actually a very nice job because we, uh, we we make this bridge between the central didactic and technology support, but there's also it's also a great possibility to do a lot of networking within departments. And in in the department that I was working at, there were like 300 teaching staff or something, and they they don't often know what's happening next door. So we we also had this uh, functionality of of telling people what the other ones were doing and a lot of networking and, and preaching at the very at, at, the, at detailed level of the individual lectures, which is often not so uh, open to study program administrators and so on. So from from a pure e-learning support, these functions developed into didactic support, curricular development support, and, and a lot of know-how now sits in this uh, educational uh, developers network so whenever you want to bring in more grease into the machinery of the, the teaching at, at your uh, university i strongly recommend to have those people who, who are mainly devoted to to didactic support at the department and not just centrally if it's after a certain uh, size and uh, and then I switched 50-50 to the position I'm holding now, and now I'm I'm fully working project-wise. So that green project area is probably 90% of my, what I'm doing, and I'm still doing some support for my former colleagues. And so this is me. If <laughs> if you're interested, I'm I have a, a family with two kids, and there's already grandchildren there. Um, I do a lot of uh, mountain sports with my wife and my my third pillar, so to say, is my band and music that I play. Good. And my workplace is ETH Zurich. So those of you who have seen it know that we have the mountains near, we have a lake, there's two campuses. One is in the center of the city and the other one is at the uh, Hönkoberg, which is a 15 minutes bus drive. And so we are embedded in a very nice landscape, um, but there's also it, it's also a very dense uh, campus, so that the, the possibility for networking for networking is great. So we we have a, a culture of so decisions are taken at Aperos, <laughs> but also a lot of information flows because you meet something in someone in the cafeteria and so on. So it's a very nice working environment. Uh, our student numbers are, are growing massively. So in, within the last 20 years, we have doubled the number of students. The number of professors has gone up too, but not so fast. So we have senior scientists that have fixed positions and are, play a key role in technology, but often also in teaching. And all, all were including, I think, the PhD students, there are 10,500 employees. We have a lot of bachelor, master's and continuing education programs. Uh, in the area of architecture and civil engineering. So um, these are always a few study programs and the engineering, the classic engineering sciences, uh, natural science and mathematics, and then what we call system-oriented natural science, which would be um, food science, health science, uh, environmental science, agricultural sciences. And we also have uh, an, an area of management and social sciences. And of course, in all these areas, data and data science has has grown like mad. And the, so, in in research, we see it all over the place. In in teaching, it's a bit less um, prominent because, as you know, teaching is a relatively conservative business. 
So once you have your program set up, you don't want to change it all the time. And, and this was recognized in, in at all departments and also in when external reviewers came to my last department of environmental system science, they also said, hey, you have great research, but it's not visible too much in your in, in your study programs, especially at the bachelor's level. So there was a, a push for bringing more of these competencies in. And so at the school level, we decided that we are having an initiative of computational competencies for to foster computational competencies and then of course first we had to say what are computational competencies so the the comp the com, uh, compressed form of uh, definition is so uh, the computational competences describe the ability to make use uh, of models based on on these huge amounts of data that have uh, fastly become accessible through the internet and through faster databases and so on. And so there was also there were also people who said, um, well, we we could uh, call it a data science initiative, but then there's also computational modeling that doesn't work a lot with data. So computational competences is the thing, and uh, th th our storytelling goes that we we have had mathematical modeling for the last. 150 or 200 years. So you you describe something with an exact formula and then you see what happens. And uh, we also have empirical modeling. That's mainly, well, a lot of, of the physics works with empirical modeling. You see something and then you, 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 uh, you try to derive um, a, a mathematically based formula from that. But the new thing is really that we have now uh, modeling that doesn't really, where, where we don't understand every detail anymore, but because just because there are, so there are too many variables that uh, we can control. So that's uh, the basis of modern, modern machine learning methods. And we, we are calling this computational modeling. So everything where the human brain is too small to handle all the variables we we call computational modeling and then of course at the eth we have these three pillars the mathematical modeling is was mainly taught by mathematics so as a basic science empirical modeling by physics but of course also by by chemistry and other natural sciences and computational modeling the basis for computational modeling was actually well, developed at the, the computer science department, and they also took over the responsibility first, but then uh, found out that this is really a, an initiative that has to be coordinated at the school level. So the school hired someone who uh, tries to bring together all the efforts in bringing more of these computational competences oh. in. Test, test. All good? Questions? Oh, test, good. <laughs> So, um, um, so that that led to me being hired by the director for for this uh, coordination job as a part time job first. And the goal of our initiative is that in all study programs, the, there's not only lectures that are uh, dealing with machine learning and data science and all that, but that's actually a, a, a pillar that has the same weight as uh, basic math, basic physics uh, have in the study programs. And we are now in a pilot period where, uh, this, where, where we look at different study programs who have actually volunteered or who have, who have already been in the process of bringing more of these computational competences in their, into their study programs. And we are extracting a lot of um, information from how these processes work at the at the curricular level so what kinds of uh, talks have to happen within the department and between the lecturers to to then bring all of that uh, um, experience into the departments that are still holding behind and are not so fast so in the that that period is now coming to an end and um, we'll establish the next phase with the beginning of the next year. And in the bachelor's program, there's about half of the 
so we have of the departments involved. And uh, they have started in different eras. So between 21 and and now in 23 was the last one. And so they are at different stages of the bachelor programs and also in the master programs. There are some uh, that are already on the way. Okay, so for before we look at what computational competences are, we, we have actually done some thoughts about uh, the classical modeling theory or philosophy. And in I don't know how it is in your technical universities, but if you study at ETH like I have done and so many now, there's not a lot of, um, of philosophy of, of science. You can take an elective, but usually people don't go to these courses. So it's also difficult to describe what's actually new about the computational models or the machine learning models. And, and we have actually gone back to, so this is still work in progress, but, but we have gone back to uh, explain actually what, what, what we mean by modeling, what we mean by induction and deduction. And if you look at that so far, the induction process where you look at the reality and the uh, form a direct theory or use look at the data and and form a theory it usually leads to a model that's completely explainable and you can then use the model to or you can then test the hypothesis uh, if your model uh, explains reality or not by deduction and if you want to test the model you can always look at the different parts of the model and uh, and and then see okay that part of the model may may need some some fix that's how classical modeling has worked until very recently but as probably most of you know if you use a machine learning model you, the model that comes out is somewhere hidden in the in the in, in the algorithm especially if you use um, uh, the neural networks and that's all over the place of course now that we don't really know what happens inside the model but then uh, uh, much more so because the model itself is a black box. We we need to um, find the validation methods for the for the model prediction. And I'm also sure all of you know that now that <laughs> if you if we use the large language models, uh, we have to do the testing ourselves. It's not that uh, we we get a model that has been tested and is sure that and we can be sure that what it delivers has some has done has done some some solar testing, but we always have to make sure that what comes out here makes sense in the real world. So here we need we really need the brain a lot to to see if what the model has produced as an output is really also what we have observed. So in a way, you know, this the function of the of the brain of of our human brain has switched from developing the model to, or it is, is actually much more important when it's about uh, judging the model's output. And I think that that's one of the, that's one of the big um, uh, shifts, paradigm shifts that we are going through. And we have to make our students not only be good programmers, but they really have to be good judges in evaluating the outcomes. Okay, so that that's a bit of the philosophy behind it. But then, of course, uh, implementing this, it's not done by just philo philosophizing about uh, models and deduction and induction. So we set up a project that's running at, um, at ETH, with, of which I am the, the project coordinator. And we have sort of four project areas. One is to come to a common understanding of the terms, what we mean by competences, by computational competences. Then there is um, one project part that works at the study program level. So how can we bring those competences into existing uh, study programs? And how, how can we actually uh, consult study programs that undergo revisions on what they should do to bring more of this in? And then uh, when once the study program has decided or is uh, is decided to change something, we have to find the the, the faculty that is um, ready to 
to actually implement these changes, but also uh, bring back their experience from research into or for, from yeah the, the latest data science research back into uh, the study programs. And then part of it, so part of that faculty support is to to uh, also make the barriers uh, in the actual courses smaller by providing, as I will talk about later, by, by providing uh, Jupyter notebooks, and maybe also take some of them by the hand who had who would have nice applications of computational competences in their courses, but who are too far away from from actually using code exercises. So we find the ones that already do it, and we find some that are potentially uh, ready to do it because it really fits nicely into domain specific courses. And then there's a, there's another one which has to do with, uh, especially with uh, machine learning. If people want to do uh, want to use computer computing power, we have to make sure that this is available also for teaching. For research, it's not just, it's not such a problem, but for teaching, it's a bit more complicated. And uh, sometimes it's also a question of having a really complicated environment with, with uh, a lot of functionalities or different programming language or pipelines that if you want to use them with students, you spend a lot of time setting up the environment and then some people uh, prefer to have a preset environment. Okay, so these are the areas of our project. And then, uh, so the computational competence is really a, a, a tricky, um, a, a tricky uh, the term because a lot of people project a lot of uh, uh, specific things and more general things into it. And we actually adapted a, a, a framework that has been used from for from the American uh, Society of. of uh, computation teachers, I think, and uh, we have extended it. And so this, we, we work now with these five areas, so the five concepts, and then we have each sub sub concept divided into the uh, in concept divided into sub concepts, and probably some of you think, "Ah, oh, well, what is this? Why isn't this there?" And that's exactly what our people <laughs> also say, you know, the ones want to think that machine learning is not different from statistics and, and inference. And others say, well, why don't you put the algorithms and the computational thinking, why don't you put this together with machine learning? So at some point we'll have to decide, but you see our framework is still version 0 0.3. And uh, at one point I decided to leave it at that and start working with what we have. And there's also uh, competency definitions that will probably change. So the, the competency is described as an ability. There would also be an environment in which this ability is, uh, is actually um, then put into practice, but that, that's left out here. And from this, from these competencies, you can actually, you can then deduce uh, more detailed learning objectives and also um, content like for example in hardened software uh, in in a lot of talks that i had with the departments on their needs they said well you know our students don't know what happens to a file when they download it from somewhere or they have they have problems uh, linking up to a network which is really basic it's computer science it doesn't have a lot to do with um, with machine learning or data analysis but there is, in certain domains uh, of, of our study programs, there is really a lack of, of those competences. And uh, the, the approach that we have now is to, to include this in, in boot camps before the semester, because we just don't have the, the number of assistants that could help all the specific problems. And we also hope that more of this will be coming from a reform in the secondary school, where computer science is now finally um, a mandatory uh, subject. Okay, so that's that's what we did, and the idea is to have then for these um, 
for these different concepts and competencies. Uh, I left out topics that would contain uh, content which is different if you talk to chemistry or if you talk to physics or or health science. But at the level of the competencies, there there will be um, further differentiation into into learning goals, and then we'll have. Um, sub-competences described and the idea is that the school um, uh, takes a decision on what every ETH uh, alumni should be have gone through. Yeah, every, every ETH diploma should be uh, should, should contain some of the, the mandatory those mandatory competences and then maybe the school also uh, recommends some competences that are not needed, but highly recommended. And the study programs themselves might also add some mandatory competences for their study programs and some highly recommended. And then depending on what specialization they do, there might be some other uh, learning objectives that have to be reached competencies. But so that the blue is what we, uh, what we aim at defining centrally or this should be in the programs until in every program until the end of the decade. This seems like a long time. A lot of the of this is already happening or has already happened, but so to be on the at the 95% level, so that the, the, the deadline is at 2030. And if you have any questions, just open your microphone and ask the question or let uh, the chat now. Yeah, so I have a question as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. You Go mentioned ahead. that uh, this is like six years more, but you mentioned that not, not all the faculties will implement the computational um, competencies courses. And why is that? Why not everyone? Or did I understood something wrongly? Yeah, or maybe, or maybe I didn't express myself clear. No, it's it, all the faculties, all the study programs. We are now especially working on the bachelor's levels because the master's levels are may, are already doing it because they're so close to research. Okay. But yeah, all all the faculties and for the the pilot project includes uh, eight bachelor's programs. But there's also I, I'm also in contact with the other ones, and and there are things happening okay. there too. And the reason why we okay, we, so, so we those are those volunteers, yeah. <laughs> the volunteers, or they just happened to reform their bachelor's programs anyway. And with one exception, all the bachelor's program who went to a, re a revision by themselves, you know, without questions, said, Oh, now it's time to bring in more of the machine learning competencies and more data science. So the the, the ones that are very reluctant are actually ones that are very much content um, driven. So where you have to know a lot of, of the details and not, not so much the, the methodology, the scientific methodology uh, connected to numbers, for example. And, and I was in one meeting where one of the professors said, ah, you know, our students don't need to be, to, don't need to understand uh, our data analysis and programming. If I want someone who's good at that, I just get a physicist. Which is, of course, true. If you want to be competitive in in uh, in science, and and your science is very much located to uh, very very close to physics, but then the, the program is not physics. It's it's another one. It's it's within the system oriented sciences. So um, some it, it also depends on the mentality of you know the people who do mainly research, but then have some foot in the in the um, science in, in in the teaching. They're sometimes not not all of them are aware that what what uh, the students should be able to when they go into um, in, into industry might also contain some academic competences that that are not so much used in industry because they it's it's always better to have some experience some practical experience in data science even if you're not a data scientist. But those are. Some, usually those are the exceptions. Okay, and another question. Uh, are you, as a 
employ, employ it in a rector's office, are you actively searching for a competent teachers to, to provide knowledge or uh, are they within a faculties or you are searching for another employees who will do such such courses uh, for every single faculty? Uh, good question. No, I'm, I'm not searching. We, we're actually working with the people that we have, but you, you point out an important uh, topic, which is probably the same at, at a lot of different, uh, a lot of the universities that are here too. Um, we, usually the math and the computer science and physics are taught by the physics and the math and the computer science department. And uh, these are, we call those service lectures. So the, the phys physics get the math from math and environment chemistry gets the math from math and uh, environmental science gets the computer science from computer science. And of course, these are sometimes specialized lectures for the for the student audience. But um, in, 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 in bringing more, and I'll show that in a minute, in, in bringing these competencies in, there has to be a close link between the service lecturers from the Department of Math and, and Informatics and uh, the, the study programs. And, and that, that's actually quite a challenge because the, the service lecturers want to know what do we have to deliver. And uh, sometimes, you know, the, the departments who receive the, the, the basic lectures uh, tell them, oh, whatever you think is necessary for our department. And, and there's, there's some domain knowledge that lacks on both sides. And, and that's, where I, that's where I do a lot of the work in bringing those people together and organizing workshops to find out what, what the needs are. And of course, there's also some, you have to make some future protection, projection, what comes in, what's next? What, what will be the, the food science engineer in, in five or 10 years? It's not so difficult to say there will be more, more data, but what to what level they have to go is often disputed. And yeah, we'll see that right away in the, when I show you some examples. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have another uh, question, if you have to, if, if this is the right place. Yep. Uh, so Jan Zalewski just uh, raised the hand, so if you would like, to, so feel free. Uh, you, you should turn on your microphone firstly. Is that right now? Yeah, yeah, it's right now. <laughs> All right. You know, uh, <clears throat> I don't have the ability to manage too many buttons in front of me, so that was the reason. Uh, but uh, the, question, the question is, well, first of all, uh, I work for one of the universities in Poland, not far away from uh, Gdańsk, and I spent 30 years in the United States, mostly in Florida, teaching there. So my question is, um, as you mentioned, it's, it's very difficult to change anything so fundamental in academia, but, but uh, I think you would be more successful um, perhaps, I don't know how it works in Switzerland, uh, to, to implement these ideas of uh, computational uh, com competencies in the uh, lower levels of education, secondary schools or, or primary schools. What, what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I, I completely agree. And that's also what, what I have seen in my career as a teacher in the secondary level. Usually the changes come from the bottom up. You now we have these social um, uh, competences that have been implemented at the secondary level 20 years ago. And, and they're coming now into our, into our realm. And with the, of course, with the programming, it's a bit different we have we've had that all the time and uh, people were just thinking well they should learn this at the lower levels and that's where it where it's coming in actually but in in the in the whole switzerland only since 2022 the fall of 22 do we have the the mandatory uh, um, computer science uh, Topic: If you want to do a matura, then leads that then leads to the university. So, theoretically, in um, starting in 26, we'll have almost every student in there who has already had contact with Python and other or any other 
of these languages and knows what a data set is and so on. But yeah, that's, and we also have actually in my office here at the Strategic Initiatives, one of my colleague works at a, 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 a project that tries together with sponsors to bring these, uh, these mint, um, Oh, what's it called in English? Is it called Mint? Uh, no, it's not STEM. The, the STEM uh, competencies, which include, of course, computer science, into the lower levels, which means start at kindergarten. Yeah. All right, thank you. Okie doke. Yeah, feel free to continue. <laughs> So that that was a that, that was quite a lot about you know what the competencies are and and so on, but then um, I, I want to show you. So we have the, the study programs that are undergoing revisions, like between five and ten years is is the average uh, a duration of a study program, end of life, and then they they are revised between five and ten years is the, is the, the half life. And then, uh, so, so if a study program decides to, yeah, we want to to revise something because the, the, the professional and the academic uh, environment has gone on, then it's a very good point to come in and say, okay, why don't you implement some of the some of those uh, competences that we want to bring in? And we have a, another project that wants to bring in uh, social more social skills, transferable skills at the social and personal level. And my colleague on the other side has a much harder time of bringing that in because people there say, yeah, that's nice, but you have to learn it outside of university because we are in an ivory tower and, and, and you don't learn to be a good manager by just learning the theory. So that's for the, those competences and for the computational competences is actually, I, I almost, it, it's, it's almost a, a self-running. It, it's it's autonomous. It happens because the the need comes in from 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 science and from industry, and we all see it. Not just not only since ChatGPT, uh, but but years before. So the the motivation is very easy. That the hard thing is really to uh, actually say if we want to bring in something new and which is big, uh, what has to go, <laughs> and. Everyone who has been involved in curriculum development probably knows that. So, when we when we do a, a new program, usually people are all already prepared to let some of their credit points go, and that's uh, that's was the case in geospatial engineering. It's actually a, a study program that has been revised. Thought the start was I think 2019, and they have some they have made some changes that were possible within the current reglementation and if you look at so here's a uh, that's how the bachelor looks like it's six semesters they usually have exams after each semester and then there are the 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 um uh, the topics that they have the courses that they the students will have in each semester and the gray ones are sort of the the theoretical back uh, this the theoretical background for the program. Then you have the yellow ones, which are the ones that are really specific to geospatial engineering. And um, and then you have blue ones that are uh, electives where they can select different categories and so on, so many modules. And if we look at our competence uh, definitions here, and we look at, for example, the programming competence, and then find, try to find how, wh where, where this is uh, built up and where it's actually then used. We see a nice build up with the two programming courses, and then there's already a project which is sort of a, it's a lab course where they use a lot of the, the topics that they have used or that they use programming to make the data analysis and also some modeling, some easy modeling. Then there is uh, Earth observation in the next semester. Then it was, there is the multivariate statistics. And then there are, of course, in the free, um, in, the, in the electives, there are also topics that pick up the programming skills and, and uh, deepen them further. So 
it here we have we we have you can be sure that what's what's taught here is not lost, but it's taken up and deepened, and it's and uh, so you can really build up competency. And the same would be true for the data and data analysis part. So they have some statistics and uh, stochastics in in the second semester, which is already used in the geodes geodesy and then picked up in the parameter estimation course. Economists work with the statistics and then in the multivariate statistics and machine learning. So that that's quite a, a successful model because once they have learned how to drive, they 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 have continuous uh, exercise and and deepening. And for the computational modeling basics, the same thing. So there's a lot of linear algebra that you need. You need statistics. You need some programming, so that the basics are there. Then in physics, there's the conceptual modeling thing. Analysis takes them further on to um, gradient descent stuff. And then they're really ready to use this in the geoinformation course and in the multivariate statistics and machine learning course. So that's an example of a, of a program that it's an engineering program. It's by itself already quite focused on data science or an, on 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 numeric methods, but it's also very well thought through in that there are no gaps. So that's a, that's one case where uh, when I work with those, the only thing I have well, my, with this program, I had to make sure that they really use the same language, programming language here that they use upstream. And there were, uh, yeah, they, they had Java first and then they switched to C and and further down the, the, the program, everyone was working with Python, but they thought that others would work with C. So it was a, talking to all the professors from outside solved a big problem within two weeks. <laughs> and and uh, of course, they, they still do some C because they, they know they have to know uh, how a fast programming language will work and uh, how you structure programs, and not script languages and so on. But but now it runs more smoothly and we also could take the analysis guy in who who is now also doing his simulations on uh, uh, with the same language. And the idea there is that if you if you confront the students with too many languages, computer languages in the beginning, a lot of the work is spent on, or a lot of the, the brain capacity goes into keeping those different languages apart instead of learning the concepts of programming by itself. So, and uh, yeah, so that that's what I have to do there. The, the rest is, is done. And actually that study program also uh, developed a lot of uh, practical exercises that we can uh, feed back into other study programs. So uh, that that was that's the that was a good example. So the the mapping of what's done where was actually done at the point when the study program was planned. Then the study program develops and some things fall fall away, and you have to make sure that. Uh, that the machine learner can still rely on the guy in analysis, uh, bringing in the, the basics of of how you do the, the the gradient descent and so on. But basically, that doesn't need a lot of um, synchronization. So my question for you would be: If you are actually involved in in curricular processes, or if you mainly care for your own um, for your own lecture, is there someone who also do do you do those mapping or those, those synchronizations between the the lectures along a learning path? Uh, if it does exist, who who is responsible for it? Are you taking care of it? Uh, all the lecturers that teach in a semester, or is the study program coordinator? Um, when is it done? Every semester or at the beginning of a new study program? How do you do it? You do regular checks to avoid uh, lectures drifting apart. And um, so my idea, because I didn't know who's who's showing up, was that you might want to uh, type a few things into the chat 
and then we would um, we would open the microphones after five minutes or so and uh, have it discussed and I might may ask you some questions. That okay? Yeah, of course. <laughs> So uh, trying to answer those questions, uh, in, in my case, I'm working at the Faculty of Chemistry. So uh, in most cases here, such um, strict subjects do not exist for all um, courses. I mean, for biotechnology, there is no such course. For uh, technological chemistry, those are available mostly in case of Master of Science, but not in all cases, not all bachelors do have those. Uh, so uh, as you mentioned, who does who does it, who is responsible? Uh, so the, the, the people that you mentioned uh, who are responsible for the cur curriculars. Uh, but as far as I know, it's not always regularly checked. In some cases, those are checked. Um, from time to time for for not every year, yeah, I should say not every year, but uh, every two or four years, it depends. But we have people who also like to um, participate in the discussion. So uh, Eva, the floor is yours. Hello. Hello. OK, so uh, thank you. Um, I will be uh, honest uh, because uh, Bartek, I, I, I suppose, was very diplomatic, <laughs> or maybe, <laughs> or maybe not. But uh, at my university, unfortunately, uh, I think something which we could call mapping competencies, I think, do not exist. Uh, because, uh, you know, uh, for the uh, curricula, for e each subject, uh, they are the pe people who uh, teach the, the subjects are responsible for, for it. However, uh, we have some um, groups of people uh, uh, which, they, which we call them I don't rem don't know how to call them in English, maybe, but uh, mm, for for uh, for each curricula, um, when we have, for example, like in my cases, um, I teach mainly students of uh, cosmetic technology. So there are a few people, group of few people who are responsible uh, uh, for for the curricula in general. There is one person uh, who is a coordinator of, of this uh, um, course. Uh, however, as I said, each uh, person who is responsible for each uh, subject uh, is preparing the um, curriculum for each subject by their own. And I do not see any uh, discussion between the lecturers and between this uh, group of competent people who are responsible for for the course in general to uh, to have that discussion to map that competencies and also um, we just put these competencies in our curricula because we had to and we check them uh, before we have the accreditation or we uh, we correct them after the accreditation com committee. So uh, something is, uh, mm, I think it is not a good situation. However, uh, according to the, mm, let's say some uh, views from uh, from the ministry, they would like to change it. However, I'm not sure if it's only awards and, uh, you know, some politically speech 
from the perspective of the ministry or uh, they really would like to change something. So uh, unfortunately at my university, at my department, um, it doesn't look like that, that we should. I know that we should because I took some uh, uh, some courses uh, to being better teacher and uh, I know I'm aware that we should do that. Uh, however, I know that at my faculty it it is not working like it should. Thank you. Well, thank you for that and don't don't feel don't feel bad about it because we are not much further here. <laughs> Okay. It's it, it's uh, you you cannot you can also over exaggerate it you know so so you you could do nothing but finding competencies but I I, I think it's the, the the way to sell it usually for me for, you know, over the last fifteen years is that if you think about ac what competencies are fostered by which action in in the in, in the lecture, you know, it's usually small parts of it, but if you look at the whole study program, it also helps to see, okay, if I do that, it, it can actually be a puzzle stone towards uh, a better understanding of nowadays uh, large language models, for example. And, and if you don't, if you, if you don't spend time on, on, on trying to find out what these changes in the minds or in the, in, in the, in the, in the real knowledge, um, erkenntnis, um, uh, don't find the English word, but that 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 helps you. That really helps you about being a better teacher. And you just have to make the experience once, and then you find out. Hey, yeah, it's not about writing it in the in the course catalog. So it's about actually telling it to yourself, and then uh, see see it in action. That that's what makes the mind change. Yes, I agree with that. Uh, so thank you for your comment. Um, however, uh, I think that uh, from the perspective of the uh, of the people who should be responsible uh, um, or who are responsible for the curricula, uh, I think uh, I think it is uh, in general uh, in Poland that uh, those people who are responsible for that that. Uh, usually a normal teachers and normal scientists. So we have a lot of work uh, and uh, I think we, we have lack of person who are only re responsible or mainly responsible for that. So maybe this is the, this is what we should change at our university. Mm -hmm. I must say I like the concept of having people who are always also researchers because if you if you keep teaching and only teaching at the university level, uh, you 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 sort of get you know you, you get you get a bit lazy, and uh, and uh, you you, you know, the the fact that you have to continually change and 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 learn is is uh, is much helped if you do research because there if you, if you stop you know you you go out it, as a teacher if a full time teacher of course can all, always continue learning but it does it's not so bad if you if you slow down and uh, uh, slowing down a bit is good slowing down too much i don't know so therefore my model is i my preferred model is that that you really have people who support uh, the the people who do research and it's also cheap. Yes. <laughs> yes, but but un unfortunately, I think uh, at our university uh, we have too uh, too many responsibilities because we need to take care about our curricula, we need to uh, conduct uh, our classes, and also we need to do the research. And then I think the uh, the week is too uh, short to put everything uh, to get inside. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. How how what what percentage of your annual hours are dedicated to teaching? Uh, in theory, so, in theory, maybe, maybe you maybe everyone can can place a, a a number in the in the chat, and we we have to make sure the chat is not made public. <laughs> Okay, in theory, uh, okay. if we have uh, um, scientific and teaching 
position, then it should be equal. But in practice, mm, I think almost 100% is uh, for teaching because we have, I think, too many hours of teaching. And then they uh, really, uh, we have a, a huge pressure about our scientific work. So uh, usually if uh, people would like to do everything uh, good, then uh, we need, to, we usually take, spend a lot more time at universities than it should be. So it doesn't, it, it, I think uh, the system should be uh, changed somehow. I don't know. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have we have more question if you are open to those. Uh, I would I would like to address train from my question because some other questions also appeared in here. Uh, th thank you, thank you. Uh, and the other person, another person in the line is uh, Andrzej. Uh, hello, thank you. Uh, hello. I'm representing Warsaw University of Technology, uh, another partner in the Enhanced Alliance, uh, mm -hmm. but I'm in minority here, perhaps. Uh, anyway, I would like to contribute to this discussion by uh, saying that uh, regarding mapping competences, we have something called uh, the Polish Qualifications Framework, which uh, defines to some extent, so to say, uh, uh, competences that are uh, expected uh, from um, any graduate. And in mm -hmm. particular for engineering programs, there are a specific uh, engineering oriented, uh, say, learning outcomes or competencies defined. So we have some kind of basis for the development of any engineering uh, uh, program. That's one point. Another one is that basically uh, I, I, I don't know whether this is also the case in Gdańsk, but in Warsaw, our university is more like a federation of individual faculties than, than a, a, a kind of, a, um, how to say, homogeneous organization uh, and for that reason basically uh, faculties, individual uh, faculties are uh, very much autonomous in uh, defining their curricula, learning outcomes, curricula and, and so on. And for that reason, actually, I think that such a reform uh, you, you just described would be extremely difficult if, in, if, if it not impossible to implement uh, in Warsaw. Thank you. Yeah, this doesn't sound too. It it sounds familiar to me. We have, we have something called the Lehrfreiheit, so the freedom of teaching, and and that's always brought. You know, if someone doesn't want to. Co collaborate at the broader um, level then they say well you know I, I have my freedom of teaching so wh why should I go through the effort of coordinating my content with a statistics teacher doesn't bring me anything I have to do work <laughs> so that that's of course an extreme thing but but that when people say that they have in the back of their minds that they have academic freedom and they can teach whatever they want and actually we are going to a really big reform process at ETH teaching now where we want to change completely the time. We want to change the timing of, of when the exams are happening. So now we have a 10 week summer break and at the end of the summer break, all the exams have happened. And we're going to take that back to the end of the semester, only three weeks preparation time. And then and then uh, there's a there's a, a huge space where students can go into practica and regenerate and do other things. So and in in this uh, in 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 the context of this uh, discussions that's still going on, we hear a lot that the people say, "Well, I am the one who knows how what what I have to teach to make the, the to produce successful um, ETH alumni," and and they always bring this. I'm completely free how I teach, the, the amount and all that. 
but uh, there are some texts, you know, some some that that actually tell that within the given frame of a program, a teacher is free to select the topics that they want to teach. But there is a frame, and the frame can be a competence frame work where, where they have to make sure that the competences that are within this framework are actually met and and a lot of these competences are specific for for the that the, they're not social competence they're really hard hard on the topic competencies so that, that I, I think at least here in switzerland it's often an over interpretation of the freedom of teaching thank you uh, and we have a Another guest and another question. Uh, it's rather a comment uh, than a question uh, because I really like what you what you said, Urs, and there is a there is a need and the, the need, but okay, we can wait for system change and etc. But we can uh, start from ourselves and 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 think in a, a little bit uh, different way. So first of all, uh, let's think that we have the final customer of our uh, program. Uh, so the final customer uh, is the person who who will get the value from us. Yeah. So we are bringing the value through the flow of learning. You know. Uh, so 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 the value is is uh, is is going through some kind of the stream and on this stream we 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 uh, each topic has its place so for example because at my faculty there is a frame uh, but uh, most of us has a problem to understand uh, what what what, uh, what the person who, who is teaching at the first semester is bringing to to to, to my student so what uh, what he is ready for uh, and what is the fundament on which I'm building his knowledge and this the, the, the next step is that I'm preparing uh, the student for my colleagues who has uh, who, who, who will teach them the new uh, the next level things yeah so um, I, I was asking at my faculty um, because I'm a part of the quality teaching of quality team or something like that. Um, so so I was recommending to to build the, the visual learning paths for for our students and this visualization which you shown us <laughs> and at one slide uh, allows us to to understand what is the the main flow and. Um, the relationship uh, and, and if we would think in the customer supplier relation so my colleague who is uh, who is leading some, some some subject at the first semester is a supplier for me because I'm teaching at the second semester and the next person and I'm supplier for, for, for the next person we could mm, see the flow and we could um, optimize the way how, how how we are teaching and what we are teaching yeah so um so i think that it's we don't have to wait for anything we just need uh to start to think about the value we are bringing to our customer and uh, that we are in the relation customer supply supplier uh, in all this uh value stream mm. So who who is the customer for you? Is it the uh, the, the person who the, the, employs the, the, the yeah. student or the student? Yeah, uh, I see two customers <laughs> because the uh, one customer is the student, but the second is the uh, the environment, the business environment. Um, oh, the, and, the society. Uh, yeah, the society. Yeah, so 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 so, so because uh, so so two customers. Yeah, who define the the way. So, so when we are defining the uh, the program, we need to think about the society, yeah. But then we are bringing the value of, uh, to to the customer and the, to the student and the society. Yeah? So, very this interesting. This is my way of thinking. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm asking the the customer question because you know I've I've stopped thinking about the 
the students as a customer, but they're more the product. Because if they're the customer, they come in and they, they think they're the kings and they want all kinds of things. But, but the, main, the core of your message is actually, I think, something that's going to, to boost in the next couple of years. Because we, we I, I, maybe in Poland, the same thing, like the medical doctors, they have a, they have these competence catalogs that are very strict, and we we or for a few years ago we started a, a bachelor of medicine too, and we envy those people because they have a, a really they have it all there, all the competences, and they just map duck duck duck. This is in that course, and so on and so on, and but they have to because it's uh, the state wants that, and. Uh, and when we try, and there's also a project going on at LED, at the Central uh, Center for Teaching and Learning, where they have tried to map and visualize exactly that, you know, for the competencies. And uh, it, the, the, so the technology is there to map it once you have the data, but we don't have the data. <laughs> and and there have been a few attempts and also a few a few uh, publications already where people have us are more and more starting to to just grab all the information that's around for for curricula um descriptions of of the, the syllabi and 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 all the the lectures and so on to actually extract with machine learning all the contents and then make the the, the competence mapping automatically and because it's all text and because we have the, the large language models are text-based. I think we we are probably pretty close. And our colleagues from EPFL and and us together, we are actually right now <laughs> setting up a, a project to compare our computational competences based on the on the information that's in the course catalogs. And maybe you know, speaking in an enhanced environment, I maybe have to talk back to Philip our enhanced uh, thing if if they're is some place to you know, extend that because the, the information is still dirty because not all the, the course catalog information is probably filled in very thoroughly, but it's a step in, it's a big step in a direction, technology wise. But are any attempts on your side to, to go through oh. the course catalogs and? No. <laughs> how, uh, how do you find out if if your predecessor what 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 they are teaching? Uh, uh talking, uh, talking, oh, talking, okay. <laughs> talking. Yeah. yeah so so, so I organized some meetings uh, because uh, when I get to the university for four years ago, I I I, uh, I wanted to to get to know where is my place in the process. Uh, so <laughs> who is my supplier? Who is my customer? And we had meetings. I organized and mobilized some people to to, to talk uh, uh, to to agree. Uh, why? Because we had also some complaints uh, from the students that we are talking about the same things on many semesters. So it, it, it's additional, let's say, an additional aspect of of lack of flow and this customer supply thinking. Uh, but um, and and I uh, I must admit that it was really good. Uh, it it we had uh, about three meetings uh, on the uh, on this topic, and uh, we created the flow of the part of the process uh, because uh, I, I wasn't able to to involve all the people. But what we did, it it's working. Yeah. Uh, so so okay. Well. We can start with simple things, just talking to each other. Yeah. Mm. And for example, I, I checked all the program. Where is my place? Who is the, uh, uh, what subjects are before? What I can use? What I need to build uh, to, to 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 help my students to achieve these competences which are coming from my subject. Um, so is that? But, but okay. Yeah, that's that's uh, actually something we have to do now with this big revision of the academic calendar where we have to be very careful that the workload within a semester is not mm -hmm. too big so we, we're combining the the lectures within the semester to exchange and that that's going to be a big boost for you know <laughs> synergies mm -hmm. yeah but, and i think that there is a uh, one thing more uh, because uh, uh connected with the uh, with the sentence which you mentioned uh so so, so to 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 um, to balance the, the workload. Um, 
in most cases we are the only person who knows the, the subject yeah we have we are subject owners and it's dangerous for the university and it's dangerous uh, for um, for development yeah you know, mm -hmm. because uh, if i'm the one i know the best yeah it's obvious <laughs> so, so 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 i think that there is a, another challenge to manage the skills yeah so so we have as in a business you have the, the the main person you have two backups for example you are managing um managing the, the competences growth um and sustain it and to, and to sustain the competences yeah so uh, so this is also what i think would be useful uh, to, to 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 sustain the path you know to sustain the flow um, Mm. Well, that's directly limited by the number of people you can hire. Uh, that's no. better. In... Mm. No, 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 no. <laughs> because, uh, for, for example, in, in my team, we analyzed uh, our competences and uh, we uh, we mapped the, the, the competences uh, based on subjects, who leads uh, which subjects, and we define, okay, our colleague is going to retire in, in, in three years, so oh. who will um, yeah. who will learn the topic? So, so it was the first step, but then uh, we uh, we know exactly how many students uh, we have on the faculties, how many people will need to lead, um, uh, will have to to be involved in teaching, uh, how many hours is it? How many people will need to have those competences? Yeah, so we can manage it. And um, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I see you were this, you're a, you're a, around it. That is very interesting to discuss with. But I wanted to place one more mm -hmm. one more information because I started with that ideal study program where um, that that has started uh, new from 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 scratch, so to say. Well, they, they have adapted an existing one. But what happens if a study program doesn't is is okay? It doesn't go through uh, revision, and that's what I want to show you with a study program that I know qu quite well, the agricultural science, and it's sort of a running system. And my my uh, my job is also to bring more into existing study programs, more of these computational competences. So if you look at it's again the semesters, credit points per year, and uh, then there are the different um, topics that they have. And if you look at what they have in the in the area of statistics and programming, they have one small course of two credit points in the first semester. Then they have a statistics course in the third semester, and then there's a, a, a data um, analysis and presentation workshop in the sixth semester, in the fifth semester. And then when they do the bachelor work, they have to sometimes an, analyze big uh, data uh, data sets. So. Uh, in a first step, to, the the thing is that the programming in uh, there's a bit of programming in the statistics, but not not much. It's mainly uh, done on paper, so that there's a huge gap between the the first few steps in Python and the first few steps in R until it's actually used. And there's in in the middle, you only have uh, subjects that are done on paper and in the field and so on. So what we started to do is we had, uh, we thought, well, that there needs to be some more programming because it can uh, to 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 be used. If they don't know any programming, then uh, it's not good. But the only place where we could put it in the curriculum without removing someone else, something else, was in the fourth semester. So uh, on, up until the fourth semester, you're not going to use programming at all. And the reason why there is not much space is because all, all these topics are important for either the, the, the animal scientists or the plant scientists or the agroeconomists, and they don't want to give away any of their credit points. Because if they if they give it up, then there's a there's a there's a hole in the in their curriculum. So the idea was okay, then let's see what um what we have in terms of topic specific uh, courses where we could actually at least train some of the stuff that they have 
uh, learned in in this course that deals with with, with Excel and and with that there's a little bit of Python involved and some visualization, but you can't do much in two credits. So there is one uh, lecture that has some teamwork stuff, and we introduced some. We 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 did a survey, and the students had to analyze that survey with the Excel tools that with the tools that Excel that Excel uh, uh, offers. And now they're also doing some research with um, that. They also did some research and and uh, and wrote reports, and that helped because. What, once we started doing that, people were starting to use Excel in in other uh, places too, where it wasn't uh, foreseen. So we we had another one where they were also using Excel in the second semester, and then in in the third semester in ecophysiology, they also started using Excel to to visualize the growth of soy plants, and finally a lecture in the fall semester also took up this Excel thing. Um, with his uh, agricultural politics course. So they did some modeling of, of uh, resource use. So that that's one way how we, we brought at least some of the some of the data yes, to be brought them close to data in, in their um, program. And uh, finally when we when we switched to Python here from Excel, we we identified more uh, lectures that could also take up uh, the Python or the, the statistics knowledge and bring it in. But that's for each for each little step that you take. You you really have to. I did that as an educational developer, and now my my successes are continuing. You really have to know the study program, and then you have to talk to people into doing that. And one big uh, hurdle of of bringing some data analysis, for example, into a lecture is that the lecturer says, ah, well, you know, then the, the students have to set up the Excel and I have to make Excel support, or I have to make even even worse uh, our, our statistical programming support. I my my PhD students, my PhD students are good at that. I'm a bit too far away from it. So the 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 thing you you have to do there is is uh, lower the hurdle. So small activation energy uh, for the for the lecturer. So we, they have to deal with something where there's not much support needed. And of course, the students have also have, if, if you really want to get at the core of a, of a question, you have to, to reduce the amount of technical surrounding that's hindering the students of doing it. And that's where the, um, that, that's where we came up with Jupyter Notebooks. And uh, so, Jupyter Notebooks is, is, is more or less an, a browser-based programming environment. Maybe if I have time, I can show you something. And uh, it, so, so you you can pre uh, so the, the the students don't have to install it on their computers, which means that they um, that no no matter what system they have, it's going to run as long as an internet uh, browser runs on the computer. And if you want to use some more sophisticated stuff, you can actually also prepare that in the programming environment and have the students only do uh, a few things that they haven't done so far. So um, that's uh, now now we're getting we're getting really down to the individual lecture. Once the, the, the lectures have been identified, we go into uh, the support of, of the of the lecturers themselves and and that's the core of the computational competences initiative now it's not so much the curricular aspect but it's how can we uh, foster the embedding of the application of the basic computational competences in in courses that are agriculturally oriented or 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 cosmetics in, uh, oriented or so on. As, as soon as, as you have data or visualization tasks, it's actually something that helps you build that up. And for that, we had some money to um, for for two rounds of, of projects. In the first round, we had um, visualization. So uh, everything that scientific visualization or modeling so people could apply for money to 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 program environments or to set up courses and concepts and we so there's two, two different sources for these calls 
and uh, the other one was more specifically focused on embedding where we had one general call where we were looking for for bachelor courses that uh, hadn't used computational uh, stuff or coding stuff before and wanted to try it out maybe in in a one or two uh, week episode of the course and so they could get some money and then in the year later we actually were asking for people who wanted to introduce their students in a bachelor course to the basics of machine learning or to the application of machine learning in their specific field and for that for that we also got um, nine uh, projects funded, 12 projects funded in, in nine different departments. And they go from uh, from re real tough machine learning introduction in, in one lecture and showing an application to uh, sets of uh, a, free, a three week episode where an, 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 uh, a mechanical engineering in a mechanical engineering course actually that has already worked with optimization methods. So computationally oriented and and in these uh, uh, in, in this area there's there's a switch going on from from classic uh, optimization methods over to machine learning and uh, the lecturer could actually uh, bring his uh, students in the fifth semester to understand what the, what 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 the the, the advantages are of using machine learning and what the disadvantages are and when it's uh, uh, when it's good to use the old uh, and when it's good to use the new technology and what has to be to happen to switch completely to the new technology so that was very nice to see and it was of course at a high level because the students in mechanical engineering already come with quite a backpack of 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 the basics and on the other side, we had an, an, an architectural history course that was using Jupyter Notebook. So the students had to, to type in some numbers and then they could, they could access a huge database of architectural his, history books. And then with a few more uh, words of code, they could compare how one, um, one building is described in one source and how it's described in other sources. So there they use the tools uh, as, as information retrieval. But since these tools are not readily available and but with a few lines of code, you can actually use modules that are around. They, they could on one hand um, uh, access the real topic of the course a bit more so they could look at their uh, make their own data analysis. And they also lost a bit of the uh, of the initial um, fear that they have of using uh, code. So that's uh, how we did most of this embedding. It's depending on on the environment, the, the, the technical environment, but it's even more depending on uh, on the readiness of of lecturers who haven't used uh, coding in their ex in their lectures uh, to to dive in. And my or our our um, our experience is that usually, often it's not the main lecturer who does it because they are already too old <laughs> or too far away, for actually, from from using the models. But they, they, it's the PhD students or some postdocs uh, who are centrally involved. And of course, with that, we have the the challenge of losing the information or we using the know-how once these people leave again. So, so one of the one of the the attention point points also lies on looking at these developments are really sustainable. Okay, um, so th that's that's just a, a description of uh, what the, the programs are look uh, are like. But so we have more than half of the departments involved, and with this we also make sure that. It's not only a, a, something that spreads from the top, from from the from the initiative that that's uh, run by the rector, but there's also a user community. Or there's also a community in the in the departments that's more or less or the developing on its own. 
and we have we hold meetings uh, every once a semester or be in between the semesters actually to bring the people together to talk about the, the new technology and didactic stuff that's available we organize courses for the people who use jupyter notebooks and want to do more embedding and there we work together with epfl which is our the other federal institute of technology in lausanne we are in a in a in a project together and we share our teaching resources and some and we also share some of the, the notebooks that are being developed which is a very nice thing so across university developing of these competences yeah i'll leave that uh, maybe yeah i'll leave it away so um what we what, what's another way of doing it centrally or of bringing the information around centrally is something called Refresh Teaching, which is organized by the Central uh, Teaching and Learning Unit, and uh, there we have we actually had a uh, in November we had an input with the same title, but it was not so much on curricular development, but much more on Jupyter notebooks themselves. And if you want to, um, if if you want to know what what happens there, it's a, I think bi-weekly during the semester. All the all the, the contributions are recorded. They're mostly in English, and uh, you can. It's really accessible under this URL. So, and then if you if you look at the website, so it's it's actually organized like that. You can click on it, and then you go to the Can you see what's? Can you see the pop-up? Yep. Mm -hmm. okay. Learning Science so, Master Code. Okay. So then, then, then you see all the videos and you see the slides. Some of them are familiar. <laughs> Not all. And uh, there's also in in this one there's there's also examples of how people used it embedded and at, at very different levels first semester and so on. And of course, there's many other things that are interesting maybe. To you, of course, we have this AI and teaching and learning stuff now, so you're invited to also look into that. Okay, so I think I open the discussion again, and if you want to, um, if you want to, I can show you how those Jupyter notebooks look like i've also prepared actually a hands-on but maybe that's a bit short but if you would like i can open the access for you and you can try it out so i'm open uh, there was a conversation regarding that at the at the chat so even mm -hmm. some links appeared if uh, i'm not sure if you were um looking at the chat during during the speech probably that's difficult <laughs> Yeah, because as mentioned here, the chat is living by itself. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's good. Yeah, I was asking what um, Jupyter Notebook is because I'm not familiar. And thank you, Natalia, for um, for answer for the answer. So now I know what what is that. Yeah, yeah I, I have I have essentially uh, moved away from my original script because there was more time for that. But um, so I actually, I, so here is a link. And if you want to you, if you want to see by yourself what Jupyter notebooks are, um, then you can use that link and log in as a guest. I'll show you how. Um, where am I? Yeah, it works. <laughs> so you you just you, you can log in as a guest. Uh, looks like this. Hang on. Um, so leads you to that page. So you look you log in as a guest.
And then the, the gas uh, is just uh, Gdansk, <laughs> old, old GDA. Okay. And then you get into the, maybe you have some special characters. I'm just using the normal Latin alphabet. And then, so th this is our the the course that we use to at ETH to bring this the teachers uh, closer to Jupyter notebooks, and then at, um, I'm not I'm not going into all the details. In, if you use it in Moodle, you can actually uh, distribute uh, assignments and so on. I had to tweak this a little bit. So if you log in, if you click on the Jupyter Lab link, then you can start the server, and. Uh, Depending on the number of students, this takes a while, but the server is locally running at um, at ETH. So other people use Go Google Colab to work with such notebooks. And uh, I've heard Anaconda, this is usually used on a, uh, if you want to install it locally. So we, we also have Anaconda things, but so the, the further away the students are from, from computers, the less, uh, likely it is to work right away. So anyway, if you go into, if you are as far as that, and uh, so then you have an assignments folder and there's an introducing Jupyter folder. And here I made so that there's a, a thing called how to structure a Jupyter notebook. And you are all working on the same, um, on this as the same user and that's that's why you all have to use one of the <laughs> one copy so I, I suggest if you want to use it um the coordination i didn't find out how we make the co co coordination the best but try renaming <laughs> the a notebook with your name and then the others see that you are using it so maybe start in the middle and work your way through and then, so what, what what happens then? Please don't use this how to structure. So this is not only code, but Jupyter notebooks have have that they're built up of cells, and these cells can be edited. And there's this special markup code that you can use to make it look nicely. So if you double click here and you see the edited cells, and they can be either of type Markdown. That's like HTML or so to to look at. Then there are raw cells which are used for student input. And there's also code cells which can be run. And so if you if you double click on, on a notebook, you actually enter the edit mode. So you could you can actually uh nope. yeah maybe that's because we are overusing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah my colleague wasn't sure if if it works but it was the, the fastest. Go back. Anyway, I'll I, I leave this guest account open for a couple of days if you want to to try it out. So, the do you, you have here a play button that leads you through as a as a student leads you through, and then you get some information, and then so that that's a didactical notebook to show you what's possible you can also in, include uh, pictures you can actually make links that guide you to another uh, part of the notebook and then here's here's the first line of code <clears throat> so you would have an explanation and if you find the code line you can actually run it by clicking here and then you get uh, an answer back there was already an answer because i had already done it and then you have you can hide cells so it's really something that can lead your students through a uh, a programming exercise or whatever there's also it this runs with python it runs with r it runs with julia depending on how it's set up and then there's also the possibility to to uh, link to feedback pages or you can uh, make students um, 
uh, solve something and then deliver the whole notebook and then it can be automatically corrected or looked at manually depending on how big the course is and and uh, so th this is a an example of one that would use coding but there are also examples where you can actually just uh, run simulations and the students have some sliders where they can change parameters so it's not it's not restricted to the students actively coding something, but you can also run simulations in there. And some people use it also to just present information without any data behind. But we use it mainly to bring coding into the, the lectures. We also have the discussion on the chat that uh, Michal says that um, you can also use cloud version of notebooks like Google Collab or Kaggle. And Kasia says that it's good for collaboration projects because few people can write at the same time. Yeah. So uh, with the Jupyter Notebooks, that the way it's set up here, the Jupyter Labs are individual, uh, unless you log in with the same user as, as you had to do. So the, the collaboration is, is not very strong here. There are possibilities, but they so that there's a, a Git integration, so you could actually use Git and uh, and uh, use the same repository, teach the, the students at the same time how to use Git for all those who know Git and versioning and so on. Um, but for the, the, we also just this week we actually we had the discussions: is it necessary for coding to be able to collaborate at the same time within the same file? Because that's quite messy, you know. It's uh, and uh, and then we we were searching for actual um, scenarios where where people have to work on the code, the same file, without uh, talking to each other. Because if they're talking to each other, they can actually sit in front of the same machine physically, or or link up through a meeting and then talk to each other. And one writes, and the other one says what he wants to write. Or so. So we, we we weren't really sure whether that was a priority. And uh, in in Moodle, you you can actually, um, if you're working asynchronously, it's quite easy. You can actually deliver the, the 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 result of your work through the through the assignment um, activity in Moodle, and then it's it's great for the whole group. But yeah, Google Colab allows uh, synchronous editing. The only so one reason why we haven't used Google Colab is that some people who had security things, you know, data privacy and so on. And and the other thing, which is probably uh, important, is that Google has ha Google has a lot of of modules installed, but sometimes we have custom modules. And in our own Jupyter Hub, the the administrator of the Jupyter Hub, he, he's very nice. He installs all kinds of strange. Um, modules for Python or whatever that that uh, can be used. So we you have direct access to to the the, the virtual machines. And um, yeah, that depending on what you do, uh, Google Colab can be quite slow. So if you have a 400 people lecture, the Jupyter Hub is our Jupyter Hub is uh, essentially uh, qu quite a lot faster. Which is uh, which is a, a, a problem, you know, if, if if you have people that you want to bring on board for using these tools and they have to wait too long, then, then you've lost them forever. <laughs> well, if you want to write anything stupid, Katarina, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Kasha, as always, yeah. <laughs> There's actually, I, I so the, the comment about the, the cloud version of notebooks, I there's a lot of stuff around. I, I don't remember the names, but I've tried it out, search, searching for the collaboration stuff. And it's quite amazing. Our colleagues in, in Lausanne have set up a, a platform where people can also co-create code. And now they have included a, an, a, 
they start to include AI tutors who help the students when coding and so on. That's that's another thing, you know. What what how how can you make sure that students acquire the necessary, the still necessary computational competences in the presence of very nice tutors who actually do the exercises for you? Okay, so I just leave the chat running and uh, open for more questions. I would like to add uh, some, uh, some small comment. Uh, I really like the idea of embedding uh, the computation, uh, uh, the skills. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, why? Because um, uh, the student is not learning, you know, um, this uh, this competence as a so so he's using it to 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 create another task yeah for, for example uh, I'm I'm teaching the production management uh, and uh, students are designing the, the the production environment line etc and and they need to, to to make a lot of calculations in Excel files and data analysis etc. So, so uh, they are learning this, this uh, how to analyze the data in the Excel file, not as a goal, but as a way to achieve the result in the project. Yeah. So, 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 so I think that is, uh, mm -hmm. and and what uh, what feedback I'm getting from them that uh, they. Um, the, the, that they are learning uh, this um, this um, data analysis uh, for certain goal, and they understand how to use it. So, so it's it's not for itself; it's for something bigger, let's say. Yeah. So, so this embedding uh, of this uh, of this competences is uh, is a super idea, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it comes with the price that you really have mm -hmm. to know much better what's happening before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, do we have any more questions? I was trying to follow up chat, but there are no uh, no more questions regarding the chat. I can you know see. Maybe you want to know who was there, <laughs> who participated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was uh, at the peak there were more than thirty people participated. Yeah. But do, now, do you, but do you want to know where they come from, or do you already know that? Uh, you mean so the, the, the people from the from the chat? No, the people from who were responding to the to my survey. Ah, yeah, uh, because uh, uh, at the beginning, the URS added the survey and uh, I'm not sure if everyone responded, but yeah, yeah, that's that's interesting. That's always interesting. Yeah, yeah and that's I, I had a look at it before to to sort of steer my my priorities. And it's quite I, I really like that, you know, because it's a technology, but it's very it's very broad. A lot of people actually do work with data so that I think that that's what was uh, I I could see that in the discussion, and some people are using it. Maybe one, yeah, that's a nice. That, I, I think that really helped helped our discussion a lot. So I didn't have to explain too much of the of of what data science is and so on. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh... Thank you, thank you very much, Urs, for for all your speech and uh, everyone else from the chat and uh, the people who were asking questions and uh, added something to our discussion. So thank you again. Uh, and it's three o'clock already, so it uh, the the time passed quite quickly. <laughs> uh, I have a feeling that you you haven't. Uh, been able to talk about everything that we were talking about previously just before your yeah <laughs> but there were many discussions that's 
uh, yeah, yeah, that that that's quite regularly in here. But mm -hmm. uh, Kasia just mentioned that's perfect timing. So thank you very much.